Real quick, by a show of hands, how many of you probably could have guessed that I was going to be in the Psalms tonight? There we go. There were some hands come up. I'll tell you the same thing that I told uh, that I told our young people in class this morning. I've just really needed some encouragement lately. Uh, with everything going on, all the things that's being said, all the things that are being done, uh, I've just really used, uh, really used the Psalms to get my day going sometimes, a lot of the time in the mornings, and uh, uh, I've just really could use some encouragement lately. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 19, so if you would mind, wouldn't mind, go ahead and turn there with me. Uh, Psalm 19. Psalm 19. There are several Psalms that you've probably noticed. Uh, are pretty popular, that are often quoted by uh, a lot of people. I think Psalm 19 is probably one of the most famous psalms. It is probably one of the most uh, often quoted psalms. I often see it or hear it in uh, podcasts, uh, all over social media, different forms. Uh, I see it all over the place. I hear people quoting it just in, in Bible based conversation. Um, it's one of the more famous psalms. What I'm hoping to do is, is put a little twist on it and to really bring out some uh, bring out some things that you wouldn't normally bring out just in everyday Bible study. As a matter of fact, that's really been uh, my goal throughout my study of the Psalms is to, uh, to look a little bit deeper into uh, what is the Israelite songbook? To dig a little deeper and to, to see uh, what God is really trying to say there. Because so often, as I've said so many times, we look at the Psalms as nothing more than short devotional type thoughts. You read through it, you're encouraged, and that's all there is to it. When in reality, there is so much... There, there's a lot of depth, there's a lot of, of meat, you could say, to the Psalms, and, and I want to get to the bone. I really want to dig in here, and I want to see what God has to say throughout the Psalms. And in fact, if someone were to ask me, Chase, where do you think I should start in a Bible study? And people often do that, by the way. They say, Chase, I'm really wanting to start studying the Bible, and I want to get into the habit of reading the Bible every day. Where do you think I can start? And the Psalms uh, often are, are where I tell them is a good place to start, is to start with the Psalms. And you'll, you'll really gain an understanding of God's will for your life if you'll read through the Psalms. And you'll see what godly living looks like uh, in the Psalms. If I had to summarize the main idea of this Psalm in particular... I think the main idea of Psalm 19 is the fact that God has revealed Himself to man. God has not set Himself way off somewhere hidden from man. He has made Himself known. He has made Himself available. He has made Himself known. And because the fact that God has revealed Himself in a few different ways, and we'll be mentioning, uh, I want to list three ways here in just a little bit, that God has revealed Himself to us and where the presence of God can be seen. Because God has revealed Himself to man, because God has not set Himself apart, because God has not distanced Himself, because of what God has done, you and I are absolutely, positively, 100%, without excuse, to not have a deep, strong, intimate, rooted relationship with Jesus. We have absolutely no excuse. All through the Psalms, the Psalm again, it, the, the whole thing is really uh, declaring the fact that God has not hidden Himself and there are ways that God has made Himself available and has shown who He is and what He's capable of in a lot of different ways. Now, oftentimes, this is, a, this is a, a portion of the Bible that is used to uh, deal with the idea of, of atheism or this idea of one who does not believe in God. And I've had those Bible studies too, and I've looked at this psalm, but really that's not the goal for tonight. The goal for tonight is not to help you uh, believe in God because I would assume that you are already there being as you're here tonight. The goal of the lesson tonight is not to help you believe in God. The idea really... Tonight's lesson is about uh, learning how to see God in the things that are around us and being reminded constantly that there is a God who is craving a relationship with you. Because I truly feel like where we go wrong so often is when we get busy during the week and in our lives with work, with school, with whatever it is that we have going on, being a parent, 
whatever it is, I think where we go wrong so often is God sort of leaves our mind. Would you agree? Our mind begins to think about what we have to do this week and our responsibilities and things that have to be taken care of. And so often God is kind of either swept in the back of our mind or He's pushed out of our mind completely. And before we know it, we're not thinking about God at all, let alone every day, all day. And God becomes an afterthought. And we're in dangerous waters when we get to that point. God can be seen in so many things. We are without excuse. For those of us who feel our relationship with God is just not where it needs to be, we really have no excuse whatsoever for that. Three reasons why we have no excuse. The first one, God can be seen, first of all, we'll talk about God's presence in nature, verses 1 through 6. First of all, number one, the heavens' utterances Verses 1 and 2. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. Uh, next slide, please. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. It says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. You know, I've said this so often. But for those who don't believe in God, who question His very existence, I often wonder, have they ever watched a thunderstorm or a lightning storm? Have they ever witnessed firsthand a tornado or wind gusts and things of that nature? Because I firmly believe every single time that I witness a storm of great magnitude, the only thing I can think about is, man, how great and powerful is my God. When I see all the things in nature that God has done, as I look up into His creation, I was driving uh, to Red Oak here last week and I couldn't help but notice the color change uh, as you're going over, uh, over the mountain on Highway 82 and I'm looking off at all the different colors of leaves and I'm looking through all the ridges and, and all of that sort of thing and uh, I couldn't help but think, man, God sure did a good job painting this picture just for me to look at. I see the awesome power of my God in His creation in what he's done. And that's exactly what the psalmist here, David, is, is saying. He says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Don't tell me all of these things that we see. You can see them with your own two eyes. Don't you tell me that that's just by, uh, by some chance that that happened, by some uh, natural occurrence. Think about the human body itself. Wouldn't you agree that just the human body and the anatomy of human beings is enough to prove that there is intelligent design, that there had to be a God who created us? You can see God in so many things, in nature, in the human body itself, in so many different ways. You can see who God is and you can see His presence. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. And I want you to notice that phrase, the heavens are, are telling the expanse is declaring, and honestly, with both phrases here, David the psalmist, he's really referencing a, a musical term. The psalmist is painting a picture of, of the melodious nature of music, as if nature itself is crying out, as if nature itself is singing this wonderful story of God and His excellence. That's the, the terminology that David is using, painting this picture of a song, as the psalms obviously are, was the Israelite songbook. David is saying that the, the, the nature, the, the heavens are singing praise. They're declaring, they're crying out. They're telling of the goodness, the greatness, the excellence of God. The heavens' utterances, proclaiming and declaring His goodness. So God's presence, you can clearly see it in nature. Don't tell me that all of these things are just natural occurrences. I know where they came from. I know this earth and all the beauty that we get to witness every day. I know when I look up at night and when I see the stars in the sky, I know that they're there because my God put them there. You can see God in His presence in nature, in the heavens utterances. God's presence in nature can also be seen second. Even in the furthest reaches of the earth, the Bible tells us starting in verse 3, it says, There is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard, yet their line has gone out through all the earth, 
and their utterances to the end of the world. In them He has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of His chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Notice in verse 3 it says, None can hear. Now, the psalmist is just painting this picture. You can see God in nature. You can see the awesome power of our God. Now, humans literally can't hear. This is, this is kind of the, the contrast he's going for. You can't literally hear the heavens crying out as they're doing. Again, he's painting a picture. But yet, in verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth. And their utterances to the end of the earth. In him is placed a tent for the sun. Also notice something in verse 6. As he talks about uh, it's rising from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. This is a clear reference to Babylonian culture and to very popular opinion at the time. You see, at this time, the people firmly believed that when they looked at the sun and they saw that, that ball of light, they truly believed that that was a God. Even the people at that time were smart enough to look at the sun and think there had to be a higher power. The problem was, when they looked at the sun, they literally thought that the sun itself was a God. It was very, very popular at the time. And so as David is, is referencing that, uh, that cultural, that, that really popular opinion, what David is, is trying to say is that there is something beyond that sun that you can't see. There is a God who controls that just like He controls everything else. There is nothing hidden from its heat. David is explaining again that behind even the sun itself is a God who is supreme. God's presence in nature. There are so many things we could talk about and so many ways that this is shown in our world. You can see God every single day in so many ways. The second way is His presence in His law. Verses 7 through 11. I told you that Psalm 19 was really all about how God has revealed Himself to man. Well, not only in nature. Not only can you look around and see God. But when you dig into the law of God, in His law, God has also revealed Himself. Uh, I'm sure that you've, maybe, I hope that you have, and if not, I would encourage you to do so. Read other uh, religious books, uh, such as the Qurans, uh, things like that. And you can tell, I mean, the difference obviously is astronomical. One is God-inspired and one is not. But when you, you really don't appreciate what you have so often until you look at other books and you realize, okay, these definitely aren't from God. And as you read these words in the Bible, it's very clear that it's all God-breathed. It's God-inspired. And God not only has revealed Himself, has He made Himself known in nature, but in the Word of God itself. I think you would agree with me that so often we take for granted the Bible. And the fact that we have the Bible that at any time we choose, we can open it up, we can study, we can learn who our God is. There was a time when the people of the earth craved and begged. They wanted to know who their God was. They didn't know much about Him, really. You and I have the Bible in its entirety, in its fullness, that any time we want, we can dig into it. Anything you want to know about God, nearly, you can find in His text, in His, in His Word. God has made Himself known in nature. He's made Himself known in His law. I, I want to talk about eight key statements that are made in verses 7 through 10. And I think these are really interesting that, that for these, these verses here, these four verses, that it's all about the law, what it is, and what it does for us. Now, clearly, I understand that this is referencing the old law, uh, but or this was written during the time of the old law, all that stuff. But if you go one by one through all of these, uh, these verses, the same apply to you and I, even under the New Covenant, as New Covenant Christians. Eight statements, key statements that are made in verses 7 through 10. The first one up here. The law is perfect, restoring the soul. The law is perfect, restoring the soul. The fact that the law is perfect is also very interesting to me. Have you ever been in conversation with a person... And they didn't like what the Word of God said. And they say something like this, I just don't understand why God did it this way. Or I just don't understand why God said this. Or I just don't understand why God would do this or would have it this way. 
or whatever, why God designed it this way. I've been a part of so many conversations like that, and it's so important that we assure people constantly that the law is perfect. Because the God who breathed it, who wrote it, who inspired writers, He is perfect. And not only is the law perfect, it's without blemish, which is a miracle, by the way. The fact that this book has no contradictions in it anywhere is miraculous. It is miraculous. The law is perfect. Everything in it is perfect. There are no mistakes. God didn't make any mistakes as He was inspiring writers to write this down. But not only is the law perfect, it restores the soul. Restores the soul. That's very interesting. The next one here. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. How many of you in here feel like you're what you would call a bit on the simple side of things, maybe? Maybe you consider yourself a little simple-minded. Maybe you're like me. I'm just a simple, uh, good old boy. There's nothing complicated. There's nothing uh, really spectacular going on with me. The testimony of the Lord is sure it makes wise the simple. Even those who feel like they're nothing more than a simple-minded, as you would call yourself sometimes. I don't agree with that, by the way. But for those of you who are saying, I'm nothing more than just a simple-minded man. Even for those people, as you dig into the Word, as you dig into the testimony, God makes wise the simple. Third thing, the third key uh, statement made. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. All through the Bible, it deals with this issue of the heart. Where is your heart? Because you would agree that so often, it doesn't matter what you do. If your heart is wrong, then what you're doing is wrong. You can go about doing the right thing the wrong way. And so often, the Bible is dealing with issues of the heart. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Does your heart rejoice in the law of God? As you think about the commandments and what God has set for you to do, do you rejoice in your heart at what God has set for you? The fourth key statement made in, uh, here in this text, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And pure, purity. There's not a whole lot left around us today that is pure, is there? So many things have been defiled, have become wicked, have been trampled on. This idea of purity or, or cleanliness. I know I've asked you this before, but it, it, it sticks in my mind when I think about this idea of purity. Can you remember the feeling that you had the moment that you came out of the waters of baptism? That clean feeling that you had. Like you knew you were without blemish. You knew that God has just cleansed you of your sin. And that, that clean feeling, I think I've said this before, but I probably hadn't showered in three or four days. I was 14 year old. You know how 14 year old boys are. There's no telling how bad I stunk. People around me probably knew I stunk. An athlete didn't want to take a shower or whatever. But at that moment, when I came out of the waters of baptism, I've never felt so clean in all of my life. And I doubt I ever feel that way again. The commandments of the Lord, they're pure. They enlighten the eyes. Fifth, the fifth key statement. The fear of the Lord is clean. There's a word very similar. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring Forever. Enduring forever. That's encouraging. The sixth statement. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Again, what God says is right. God made no mistakes. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. My mind is taken to our study of Revelation. This idea is shown all throughout the book that the judgments of the Lord are true and they are righteous. Next here. They are more desirable than gold. Man, that's interesting. Have you ever studied uh, different gold rushes that have taken place throughout the United States in our history? 
When gold would be discovered in certain places in the country, thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes more, people would flee, uh, they would leave, they would, they would flood these areas where, where gold had been discovered, would spend all that they had to get there, to get what they needed to go search for gold, would, would really abandon their life, they would abandon their families, they would abandon their jobs, they would abandon everything in search of gold because that's what gold meant to them. They are more desirable than gold, verse 10. In this last one here, they are sweeter than honey. They are sweeter than honey. The text uh, actually says they are uh, more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Now as you look at all of these key statements that are made, the law is perfect. It restores the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. They are sweeter than honey. We are without excuse. God has made Himself known in His law. Time and time again in the Bible, you can see that God has made Himself available, that God has made Himself known. And as you read what the law is and what specifically the law, the commandments, the precepts of God, what it does to you, what it does for your life, we are without excuse to not have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. We have this at our fingertips every single day. If you so choose, you can dig into the Word of God every single day. You can know what the will of God is. It's not a mystery. It's been made known to you. You can know your God. Your God wants to know you. We are without excuse. I hope that I'm hammering that point because that's exactly what I'm trying to do tonight. We have no excuses for not having a deep relationship with God. We see Him in nature. We see Him in His law if only we will open His law. I think what Curtis mentioned this morning is an absolutely fantastic idea. Read through the whole Bible. I think you will be enlightened in a lot of ways about so many of the things that you find there. Read through the Bible every single day. That's part of communication, correct? I know that as Sadie and I were, were sitting down and we were going through premarital counseling, that word came up a lot. The word communication. Because I think you'll agree, for those of you who have been married for very long at all, uh, I haven't been married very long, and I'm figuring out very, very, very quickly that communication is, is huge. In a lot of ways, it's absolutely everything. You have to communicate with any relationship, not just with your marriage partner. And when it comes to your relationship with God, it's very similar. There has to be this communication. We know how we communicate with God, of course. We have this avenue of prayer. Although God knows what's going on, God craves uh, that prayer time that you sit down and you tell Him what's going on. God wants to hear from His children. Much like an earthly father wants to hear from his children. Uh, my dad, not really uh, an emotional guy. He's not the kind of guy to say, uh, most of my life, he wasn't exactly the kind of dad that loved to say, I love you, uh, just real emotional and, and, and that kind of guy. But I can tell since I've moved out, I can tell my dad misses having me around a little bit. And he probably wouldn't want me to tell you that, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I can tell he misses having me around. Maybe it's because he misses having me do all the work around. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. But I can tell every time I call my dad in our conversations, they're so much different than they were when I was growing up. I can tell my dad really loves getting to talk with me and getting a chance to conversate. When we get to go hunt together uh, or go fish together, I can tell that that time means a whole lot to him, and I know it means a whole lot to me. In the same way with, with, with our God, with our Father in heaven, he loves to hear from you. He loves when you sit down and you, and you just let him know what's going on in your life. And when you sit down in that part of communication, how God communicates to us, obviously, is the way that He speaks to you through His law, through His Word. And so if we're not praying, if we're not saying, God, here's what's going on. And sometimes for me, it's nothing more than, than this is what I have going on in my life. just wanted you to know. Sometimes my prayer time looks like sitting down and saying, God, I just want to tell you thank you for whatever it is, for X, Y, Z. God, I just want to tell you thank you for my wife who loves you. And thank you for leading her to me. God, thank you for, for this, this congregation that I have. Uh, and these people that I get to work alongside for you. God, thank you for, for whatever it is that I have on my mind that day. And sometimes, it's, it, it's sometimes for me, it's God, this is what I have coming up. 
And God, I'm trying not to stress about it. Help me not to stress. Help comfort me. I mean, there's so many different things. You'll never run out of things to talk about, I promise. There are things going on. God wants to know. Sit down with Him. Get that prayer time. I promise you, you will be blessed. You will not be sorry you did it. Sit down and talk to God sometime. Every day if you can. Open His Word up. Hear what He has to say. Hear the way He communicates, the way He's talking to you. You'll be amazed at how often you sit down to study the Bible and you'll see something that is so practical with what you're going through. You ever done that before? Maybe it's in a sermon that happens a lot. You'll be sitting there and, and Curtis or I, either one will be up here and we'll be preaching. And it's like, man, I really needed to hear this. The same thing happens in Bible study, I promise. It's amazing how it works. God's presence is shown. It's clearly seen in nature. It's clearly seen in His law, in His Word. Another point I want to make before we, we leave this one are the warnings that we find in the Word as well. In verse 11, it says, Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. That is all those things that he's just got through talking about in verses 7 through 10. We are without excuse. The Bible warns us what will happen if we're disobedient to Him. God warns. God tells us. This is how you live a godly life. This is what it looks like. This is what it doesn't look like. And this is what's going to happen to you if you're not obedient to me. And He does that so that when we stand before Him on Judgment Day, that we are without excuse. We have no reason. We can't stand before God on Judgment Day saying, God, uh, you just don't understand. I just didn't know. It won't happen. Often, people ask me, well, what about those people that don't have the same privilege as we do to have the Bible in their hand every day and, and they're off in these remote areas and remote parts of the world? Have you ever considered this? That's our job, is it not? Is it not our job, our commission to preach the gospel to all the world, to all creation? So in all seriousness... Though God has set eternity on the hearts of all men, we know that, that, that God can be seen and that God promises that those who seek Him will find them regardless of where you are in the world. Would you not also agree with me that so many of those people, it's our responsibility to let them know, is it not? It's on us. The idea that somebody could stand before God on Judgment Day and say, God, no one ever told me. Can that not be said that it's on us for not doing our job, our part? Just something to think about. Something to stir around. The Bible's warnings are very clear. We're without excuse. God tells you exactly how to live a godly life. Not only does He tell you, but He showed you in Jesus. And I want you to know, not that I'm not mentioning Jesus, of course, in this sermon, but I'm not even talking about God's presence being shown uh, in Jesus and who He was. Emmanuel, literally, as Curtis mentioned this morning, God with us. No better time to have seen who God is and to come to know Him than when Jesus walked the earth in the form of man, being God Himself. God's presence is clearly shown in nature. God's presence is clearly shown in His law. And third, and this one I really like, God's presence is shown in His people. Now I'm going to tell you something that, that uh, may blow your mind a little bit. Just bear with me. Did you know that I, myself, personally, have seen Jesus? Yeah, it's true. I've seen Him, personally. With my own two eyes, I've seen Jesus. Here's something even crazier. Did you know that you, personally, have seen Jesus, too? Did you know that? that for all of you who are children of God, that you've seen Jesus, too. I've seen Jesus in the form of a person helping me when I needed it the most. I've seen God's wisdom in the form of a person who gave me godly advice at just the right time when I really needed it. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that you literally, you, you, could, you could, in a sense, you could see Jesus in a person? Of course, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not literally talking about Jesus in His glorified state standing before me. The whole point of us and what we're trying to do is to, to, to allow people to see Jesus in us, is it not? That's the point. That's what we're trying to do is to get to the point where those people, where those outside the church can see Jesus in us. I've seen Jesus. I've seen God so many times in the form of people. I want to live my life in such a way that people see Jesus in me. 
God's presence in His people is shown in godly living. Look with me in verse 12. It says, Who can discern His errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. God's presence is seen and shown in His people. And I, let me elaborate on this a little bit. Paul alludes to this in the book of Romans, the first couple chapters especially. He alludes to it all the time, really. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who seeks for God. All through the Bible, this idea that there is no human being that by nature seeks for God and craves righteousness. That's not the nature of man. The nature of man from the moment that, that sin entered the world in the garden. The intentions of man that was bad, is wicked. People were not good. And that's why what Jesus did is so important because man by nature is not good. And when I see a person living a godly life, I know it's because only... God has made Himself known to them and that God has changed them. In godly living, man is not by nature righteousness. He's not righteous. He must be made righteous. Human beings living lives of moral excellence doesn't just happen. We don't just choose that for ourselves and get to doing it. And when I see the way that some of you behave, when I see the way that you treat each other, what did Jesus say? For you fed me when I was hungry. When I was hungry, you fed me. Uh, when I was naked, you clothed me. And they said, well, Jesus, when did we see uh, you naked and clothe you? When did we see you hungry and feed you? And he said, what did he say? And I'm paraphrasing, of course, it's when you saw each other naked and took care of each other and you served each other. In that, you, in a sense, you have served Jesus himself. That's exactly what he said. Godly living is not something that happens just by nature. Godly living is something that happens when God has come into a person's life and changed them. God's presence. I can see God in the church, in its design, in who we are, in the way that we behave. I can see the presence of God. Lastly, in those who speak and meditate on His teachings in verse 14, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Those who speak and meditate on God's teachings are those who show what godly living looks like. It's those who show exactly what Jesus was like. We are absolutely without excuse. There is absolutely no reason for us to not have a deep relationship with God. God is literally everywhere that we look. In nature. In His Word that we study every single week together. Even if you don't study it on your own, which I hope that you do. You're getting it every single week. The Word of God is being preached to you. Hopefully you're going to Bible class and you're hearing the Word of God being taught. You're getting it. God is showing you. He is making Himself known to you time after time after time again. Everywhere you look, there is evidence of a supreme God. He is constantly reminding you, constantly reminding us that He truly is Lord of all creation. We have no reason whatsoever. We have no excuse not to let Him be the Lord of our lives. We have no excuse to not make Him the number one thing that you think about every morning when you wake up. We have absolutely no excuse to not really know who He is. We have no excuses not to have a better relationship. And so I ask, how is your relationship with God? Is it strong? Is it able to withstand testing? Tonight's a really good night to think about that. Tonight's a really good night to decide to take this whole following Jesus thing more seriously. To make Him the Lord of your life. You know what it means to allow Him to be Lord. That means He calls the shots. That means He makes the decisions. If you will wake up every single morning and think just a couple of things. 
You know, Jesus, this, this whole being a Christian thing, I think we make it so complicated sometimes, and it's really not complicated. As a matter of fact, Jesus summed it all up in two sentences. You know what he said. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what this is. If you will wake up every single day, and as you're getting started in the workplace, at school, uh, whatever it is, even when you're at home with your family, if you will start your day every single day saying, I'm going to love my Lord, I'm going to love my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. And the second thing is, today I need to seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things that He's talked about there in Matthew 6 will be added unto me. If you'll wake up every single day saying those things, I promise you will not be disappointed. Hope that you've enjoyed Psalm 19 tonight. Of course, we want to help you with your relationship with God. That's a huge part of what we do together as the church. We want to help you get to where you need to be. Maybe that means praying together. Not just tonight. Maybe that means praying together every day for the next little while. I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that, whether it be in person or whether it be uh, me calling you up on the phone and us praying over the phone together. I'd love to do that. If that means sitting down studying the Bible together, I'd love to do that. We want to help you. That's why we're here. We're a family. It's, it's no uh, coincidence that Paul refers to the church as the household of God. We're a family. Let us help you. The thing is, we can't help you unless you tell us what you're in need of. Tell us how we can help you. If you're in need of anything at all, please come as we stand.